Spider-Man. I love Spider-Man, and I mean I love Spider-Man. As far back as I can remember, I have always been watching, playing, or dressing up as the webhead. There's just something about this guy in red and blue spandex that shoots webs out of his hands and swings from building to building that I just can't get enough of. And recently, I've been thinking a lot about Spider-Man. Mostly because... <gasps> and it's made me think, what are the Spider-Man movies? N no, which Spider-Man movies are the best? Uh, I don't know, you tell me. I feel like it's always me talking in these videos. Can you contribute for once, please? So today we're gonna start with the Raimi trilogy from all the way back in 2002. And look, enough talking from me. We've got a lot to get through, so let's just get the show started. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Where do we even start with the original Spider-Man from 2002? In an era where superhero movies were very hit or miss, mostly miss, here comes along this tiny little blockbuster that elegantly adapts this comic book character to the big screen, convinces general audiences that superhero movies can be good, and makes the most money any film had ever made at that point. Every time I rewatch the original Spider-Man, I always get nervous and worry that it won't hold up to my feelings of it. And somehow, every time I watch Spider-Man, it always gets better. This is the perfect introduction to the character. In the first five minutes, you know everything you need to know about Peter Parker. He's shy, he's a nerd, he's hopelessly in love with this girl, Mary Jane, and he's got a big heart. He's the underdog in this world, and you can't help but root for him. Not long into the film, when he finally gets the courage to ask Mary Jane to take her picture, down trickles a genetically altered spider and goes, ow! Suddenly, Peter doesn't feel too good, and when he wakes up, damn, Toby. I always love how he just looks right at his dick. Like, <laughs> is that what he's implying? <laughs> Big change. Anyways, the movie brilliantly takes us for the ride with this nerdy kid who begins to discover how to use these new powers. Climbing up walls with Peter is exhilarating. Jumping into the air is breathtaking. And shooting webs from your wrist is kind of gross, actually. Yeah, ugh. Any kid who got these powers and went from a nobody to somebody overnight would be drunk off of pride. And we see that when Peter wants to buy a car to impress Mary Jane and then signs up for wrestling matches. And wins. But he's only given a couple hundred instead of the $3,000 offered. After being told, I missed the part where that's my problem. He walks away and in comes a robber. The robber escapes and Peter has a choice. He can either do the right thing and stop the guy, or he can be selfish and want revenge. And that's what he chooses. I missed the part where that's my problem. Full of ego, he walks out to find that his Uncle Ben has been shot by the man Peter let go. This is all his fault. Now let's wind back a little bit. The reason this film and this trilogy work is because they're not about Spider-Man. They're about Peter Parker. We spent a good time at the start of the film just getting introduced to him in various characters. His crush MJ, his best friend Harry, his beloved aunt and uncle, and many more. These relationships and connections Peter have are the heart of this film. We buy that this socially awkward guy wouldn't know how to say anything to the girl he likes. We buy that he has a loving relationship with his aunt and uncle. And we buy that when this heart of gold kid gets superpowers, it begins to change him. He starts pushing his family away, tries to be cool by winning a fight at school, and becomes more and more of a twat. Uncle Ben's stops him in the car and calls him out on it in this really well acted scene. He's just trying to lend a hand to Peter and tell him that he's there for him. And being the moody teenager he is, plus now having all these spectacular superpowers, he isn't having a bar of it. Uncle Ben then drops this. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. That line right there, that's what this film, this trilogy and this character is about. But Peter doesn't give a shit because he's 17 and he's mad. So he walks out angrily, goes to this wrestling match, doesn't get paid, lets the robber go, and then as a consequence of his lack of responsibility, his beloved uncle dies. This entire setup of introducing Peter and throwing him down to fail sets up the rest of the movie and lets him become Spider-Man. And oh my god, it is so fun to watch him be Spider-Man. Let's talk about the web head for a second. This suit is so good. What I love about it is that they take the iconography from the comics and adapt it to be better for the screen without going too far that it's unrecognizable. I love the colors, I love the sharp lenses, I love the raised webbing, oh it's incredible. But it doesn't matter how good the suit looks if it doesn't move well. But luckily for us, <laughs> luckily for us, this film is being made by motherfucking Sam Raimi. <gasps> Best known before this for the Evil Dead films, which are full of stylistically cinematography and charm, Sam Raimi perfectly elevates his character to the big screen. These films only work because Raimi is the one behind the camera. He just gets how to shoot Spider-Man. He has these long, uninterrupted shots of the camera swinging through the street, and so we get to swing with Spidey and it's exhilarating. And he's always using Spidey's moves to the fullest extent, really capturing the iconic imagery of the comic book panel 
parallels through stylized positioning of the character. It's just fun to watch Spidey swing about and punch bad guys in this film. But the real reason why it's so fun and engaging to watch Spider-Man do anything is because we care about the characters. Raimi beautifully balances both the bombastic superhero stuff with the sentimental and down-to-earth character moments. And this is exemplified no better than with the villain of the movie. The Green Goblin. Hello, my dear. The Green Goblin is such a perfect villain because not only is he this deliciously evil, over the top screaming maniac when he's in the suit, but when he is out of it, he is this super sympathetic, charismatic scientist, Dr. Norman Osborne. When we first meet Norman, his funding is getting cut, and immediately we feel for him. After performing the test on himself to mix results, he begins his descent and spiral down into madness. Also real quick, I love that Green Goblin and Spider-Man are born on the same night, that's very cool. Willem Dafoe does an absolutely brilliant performance as the Green Gobby, but it's all of these scenes as Osborn that steal the show. You never quite know if he's genuinely a victim or if he's just insane. Every scene can be comedy one second and horror the next. There's this brilliant moment where he's in the mirror talking to himself, but it's not himself. It's Norman and the Goblin, and it's acted brilliantly by Defoe. And what makes him even more compelling is that he has his father-like appreciation for Peter, which wouldn't sting as bad if he didn't have his very own son who just happens to be Peter's best friend. Is that fucking James Franco? What? He opens up more and more to Peter and lends out a hand wherever he can. And then when he realizes that Peter is Spider-Man, the gobster has blackmail to use. If choice and responsibility are the main idea driving Spider-Man, then the second is Peter and Spider's life constantly crashing into one another. There's something so engaging about his best friend's dad being the villain who is now putting all of his closest loved ones in danger. Which happens because the gobster kidnaps Mary Jane and a bunch of children and then makes him choose. Who will he save? He saves both, I don't know, I guess he's just built different. And then they land in an abandoned building and we get this honestly really brutal fight where the goblin kicks the absolute shit out of Peter. I've always loved how raw and dirty it is, especially when this bomb goes off and Peter's face is off. Eventually, Peter gets the upper hand and Norman reveals himself, claiming, I've been like a father to you. Which Peter responds with, I have a father. His name was Ben Parker. His death wasn't in vain. That one important lesson of great power and the need for great responsibility to follow are what shaped Peter into the man he is now. The Spider-Man. <laughs> but Norman doesn't really give a shit because God speak, Spider-Man. <laughs> Yikes, right in the balls, fucking ouch. But is it not so cool that we get this outer sequence one-liner oh. that just perfectly captures the realization of the moment? Classic Raimi right there. Yeah, classic Raimi right there, guy. My money run my And all those personal stakes and clashing relationships which I was banging on about, well, it comes to heat when Norman's last words are Don't tell Harry. <laughs> What? Peter now has to lie to his best friend about how his dad died. And he can't tell Harry he's Spider-Man because he needs to protect his friends. Oh, it's just so good. This film just hits it out of the park but again, mostly because they really make you care about the characters. Watching Peter relentlessly chase after MJ, who is dating his best friend, but is secretly in love with the masked man who keeps saving her life is so enjoyable. It's iconic, I know, but there's a reason we all remember so fondly this upside down kiss. It's not just that Peter finally gets to kiss the love of his life, it's that she doesn't know it's him, and in that way, the kiss is almost melancholic. And you know what, let's talk about MJ for a second. Going back to this film, she is one of the most dated parts, just with how far female protagonists have come in big blockbusters since then. However, she still has this really beautiful arc of learning to stop putting on a show for others and take agency with her life and choose what she wants. She stops being the party girl and pursues her dream of being an actor. It doesn't go perfectly straight away, but she's finally learned to try. And then at the end of the film, she decides she's gonna put her foot down and not listen to anyone and go for what she wants, which she realizes is Peter. I love you so much, Peter. But Peter knows he can't have that. If he's selfish and loves her back, then she'll never be safe. That's what having this responsibility means. He has to make a choice because he is Spider-Man. One brilliantly energetic final swing later and roll credits. Man, what a movie. But it's not all perfect. I'm always surprised at how well this film holds up, but there are a lot of things here that are very early 2000s. Like this one parade, some of the CGI, some of the visual effects, and this one really homophobic joke. That's a cute outfit. 
Did your husband give it to you? Damn, Spider-Man, chill, dude, fucking all right. And Toby. I love Toby in this role, but there are times, especially in this first film, where he just falls flat. I think he looks the part and he's really great at doing these subtle and quiet monologues, but then a lot of the bigger stuff, especially in the suit, doesn't feel very good. The quips, especially, which are such an essential part of the character, always fall flat. It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. What? what? Saying that though, Tobey Maguire's screams are iconic. And this is such a tiny nitpick, but this is the only Spider-Man film not in the cinematic ratio. Well, why would you do this? But look, this movie got so much right on its first attempt and paved the way for not only the future of Spider-Man, but superhero movies in general. I don't think we'd have the MCU or the billion superhero films we've had since 2002 if they didn't get this movie right. And it's because people like Sam Raimi cared so, so, so much about this character and believed in it that they were able to get it right. And there were so many things I loved that I didn't even get to mention such as J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, <laughs> he is perfect. Or this incredible theme by Danny Elfman, which perfectly captures the feeling of responsibility. Or of course, all the memes. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. What a fantastic first entry. And then how in the world do you follow up from there? With Spider-Man 2. It's weird thing with my brain that when I love something, upon reconsumption, my brain goes into this skeptical, over-analytical mode where it looks super hard for faults just so it can go, ha, you actually don't like it, ha, 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 ha. And every time I watch Spider-Man 2, I feel like I get more and more scathing on it, which is actually maybe a good thing because this film is very good and I can use that annoying skepticism to further find out my points and what I think works and doesn't and why. So how is Spider-Man 2? Pizza time. Yeah, it's still the best. It almost feels like beating a dead horse talking about how good this film is, but you know, it deserves it. It is not only a brilliant sequel, expanding and exploring further on the ideas introduced in the first movie, delivering a new villain who is just as good, if not better than the Green Gob, and doing nothing short of exceeding the expectations set by its predecessor. And then it is also just a good film, not a superhero film, just a good film that holds up unfairly well for a 15 year old movie about a guy climbing up walls. If Spider-Man was about Peter Parker learning what responsibility is, then Spider-Man 2 is all about choice. Right from the very first minute, the film introduces the idea that Peter is struggling to be both Peter Parker and Spider-Man. He can barely keep a job, he's always late, his grades are slipping, he's losing friends, and maybe most importantly, he can't be with the girl of his dreams. Here's the thing though, this version of Peter has such a big heart and that aspect of this character is executed so well by Toby that it's almost really enjoyable to watch this guy's life just suck. <laughs> <laughs> when he enters this just abysmally small and crappy apartment and then sits on the bed looking like shit, we feel that. And if that's not enough, this film is also about Mary Jane Watson. Peter made the choice to reject her at the end of the last film, knowing if she was with him that she'd always be in danger, because he always has to be Spider-Man. And then we have to watch him revel in the regret of that mistake as the girl he loves is constantly taunting him left, right and centre. At Peter's lowest, he is always reminded of her presence, and this is shown no more than in one of the best scenes of the film, the high society party. Firstly, he asks to be paid in advance and is responded with, <laughs> which is just, oh, come on, it's perfect. And then he rocks up, can't get a drink, Harry shows up, has an angry tone, then Mary Jane rocks up with her fiance, who is his awful boss's son, Peter tries to sway her with poetry, still can't get a drink, and then Harry comes in, slaps him in front of everyone, and then Mr. Astronaut proposes to Mary Jane, and she says yes, and then Peter is forced to take the picture of them. Fucking Jesus Christ, sorry Pete. This scene is followed by a lonely and solemn swing through the night sky, which juxtaposes nicely against the exclusively heroic and triumphant swings we've seen so far in the trilogy. Halfway through in Spidey experiences, oh. ah. Peter begins to lose his powers. Now, why is this exactly? Well, it's because of his love for Mary Jane. That's what this film is about, love.
Also, Doc Ock is here and he's played by Alfred Molina and it's like the best supervillain performance of all time. Yes, I know it's stupid he puts the inhibitor chip in a tiny piece of plastic exposed on the back of his neck. Shut up! Yes, it's stupid that a pun from Spidey doesn't just kill him since he's a regular guy. Shut up! Yes, it's stupid he throws a car at regular man Peter Parker. Oh, okay, shut up, I get it! The reason Doc Ock works is because he isn't a villain. He's a good guy, a genius. He has this great selfless vision of free, renewable energy, a loving and human feeling relationship with his wife Rosie. And he teaches Peter the most important lesson of the film. Intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift. And you use it for the good of mankind. Yes, it's cool that he has these stylistically brilliant arms that were real props and it creates all this amazing action and set pieces. Yes, it's so cool that we get to see this breathtakingly amazing horror scene of him awakening with the arms. Yes, it's so cool we get to see him slowly turn more and more evil as the AI corrupt his brain. But the reason Doc Ock works so well is because Otto Octavius is a well-established and developed character. We don't want him to die, we want to redeem him, just like Peter does. And let's talk about that ending scene for a second. Mary Jane is kidnapped, again. Okay, like, like, like it's a bit frustrating, but at least they won't do it a third time. <laughs> but what's brilliant is that it's not just punch punch bad guys sort of stuff. It's as emotionally driven and character focused as every other aspect of this film. When Peter takes his mask off, humanity begins to restore itself in Otto's eyes. And remember that piece of advice that he gave Peter at the start of the film? Well, this movie is so precisely written and constructed that themes and ideas successfully interweave throughout from beginning to end. Peter reminds Doc Ock of his humanity at the end with the exact same quote. You once spoke to me about intelligence, that it was a gift to be used for the good of mankind. A privilege. After Peter restores Otto, he immediately chooses the selfless act of drowning himself in the river to save the world. Because we've come to care for this guy, hearing him in his last breath utter, I will not die a monster, is so satisfying. You root for him to come good almost as much as you root for Spidey. And then maybe the best moment in the trilogy happens when a maskless Peter turns around to see Mary Jane. A giant sigh of relief. This is such a good performance by Kirsten Dunst. Every tiny bit of suspicion and wonder she's had has finally been confirmed, and it's this great weight off her shoulders. And then, you know. Hi. <laughs> that is so funny and so Peter Parker. And let's stop real quick. I've talked almost exclusively about Peter Parker, and that's cause, to me anyways, this has always felt like more of a Peter Parker film. Don't get me wrong, there is plenty of spidey action, but this film feels more about the man behind the mask than the figure himself. The arc Peter goes through on this journey, struggling to balance his life between himself and the responsibility of being Spider-Man, just falling down more and more until he eventually can't take it, accepting that maybe you're not supposed to be Spider-Man climbing those walls. And then having this beautiful homage to Uncle Ben's speech from the first movie, which is turned on his head when he says, no, I'm not Spider-Man anymore. I want to live my life. I want to be Peter Parker. I'm Spider-Man. No more. No more. And then we get the best scene in the film. The raindrops keep falling on my head sequence is really just genius. After such an emotionally heavy and serious moment, the midpoint of the film starts with this goofy, cheesy montage of Peter being really happy. He's smiling, his grades are doing great, he's content with avoiding his responsibility. Just watching Peter finally get to be himself and chase after the things he wants is temporarily liberating. And this freedom he now has from choosing to just be Peter Parker lets him do two important things. One, he finally sees MJ's play, tripping her up on stage, and then poetic chases her out on the street and he finally confesses to Aunt May about Uncle Ben's death. Alright look, you're gonna hear this a lot later on but what annoys me the most about the MCU and maybe just the current state of superhero cinema in general is that moments just can't sit with you anymore. It feels like serious things always have to be followed up by a joke but back in 2004 we got this long, quiet, uninterrupted two minute monologue of Toby just confessing what really happened that night. I held his hand when he died. It's uncomfortable, it's brilliantly performed, and it really leaves an impact. Tobey Maguire is really good at small, subtle acting, and that skill of his really shines in this scene. And I just love how May can't even say anything. She just takes her hand back, disgust, and then leaves. It's at this point that the consequences of choosing not to be Spider-Man finally start to catch up to Peter. There's this brilliant burning building scene, which a lot of people rag on a lot, but it's a really important turning point for his arc. We get to see that the real hero was never Spider-Man, but always Peter and his good heart. He runs in with no powers, weak as hell, just to save a little 
little kid. And then after almost dying in the set that looks really good, he reunites his kid with the parents. But the best part of it, the most brilliant part, is when one of the firemen says, Some poor soul got trapped on the fourth floor. Never made it out. It hits him. If he was still Spider-Man, he could have saved that other guy. It then moves to Peter asking himself, Am I not supposed to have what I want? What I need? And it's just brilliant. It's such an excellent way to show Peter's inner conflict. And then we get... Hi, would you like a piece of chocolate cake? Ah, I love you! But you know what I also love about this film? Spider-Man. Yeah, you could, you could probably already tell that though. Although the main heart of this film is Peter's inner conflict with what to do with himself and the mask, when the mask is on, it's just better and snappier and more thrilling than the first by every mile. Sam Raimi and the crew elevated the action in every way they could. I mean, you have these amazing shots such as... Ooh. But in general, everything seems more realized. A lot more of the fights are higher up, really making you feel the vertigo allowed by the powers of this wall crawling arachnid. His webs and powers are better utilized, such as Spidey shooting web balls at robbers, webbing things to throw at Doc Ock, or slingshotting himself across buildings. The hand-to-hand -hand combat seems to be more impactful and better choreographed than the first film, and even the quips are a lot better. Here's your change! Like I said before, I think they all sounded pretty rubbish in the first one. But when he speaks here, I always thought it was pretty well done. But nothing, and I mean nothing, will ever be able to beat the train fight scene. This is just one of the most brilliant action sequences in any superhero film ever. First off, we're anticipating Spidey to return in this energetic dolly where Toby busts out of the rubble. He takes the glasses off, clenches his fist, and we know Spidey is back. And then through the paper, he once again swings energetically through the streets of New York, which then was just a reflection of Doc Ock's glasses. Oh, come on! They chat briefly, do a bit of flirting, and then get to work. A couple of punches are thrown, and then they brilliantly use Spidey's powers once again, having him be suspended off a web while he throws a piece of clock back at Doc Ock, and then he falls and brings Doc Ock with him, and... The train. What happens next is five minutes of amazingly directed action that is not only so fun to watch, but expertly showcases the visual abilities of these two characters. You've got Spidey and Doc Ock climbing around this train. At one part, Doc grabs him and launches him, and then he narrowly fits through the crack and lands a punch. In this one amazing shot, they're both on the side of the train, and the camera turns upside down and then pulls back to reveal how fast they're going. Holy shit, what a good shot! There's this one bit where they're punching on the side, and a train comes from behind, and Spidey quickly looks back, and then at the last second slams he's back on the window and wow Toby <laughs> my man you're free this weekend baby and then in another part Spidey gets knocked off the train slides on the road and quickly gets himself back up as we hear <laughs> and then this shot this shot right here never fails to leave me smiling it's just so good, guys. Come on. Eventually, Doc Ock says, I'm sick of your shit, Mr. Webex bottom man. And almost comically makes the train accelerate to max speed. <laughs> Why can the train do this? We get this brilliant shot showing us the scale of the city and how little room Peter has left to work. This part is brilliant because even though he's exposed as Peter Parker, he still puts himself at the front of the train and tries to save all these people, even if he doesn't quite know how. We have to watch him use his intuition and think on the spot. He tries stopping the train with his legs to no avail. Any more bright ideas? Yeah, how about I leave this train and let you fucking die, old man? Jesus, what? watch your mouth, man. He tries webbing the buildings and nope. And then we get the last ditch effort. Lots of webs. Yes, Toby makes a stupid face, but watching him push his entire might to stop this train and save these people is always so enthralling to watch. It begins to slow down and right at the last second, it stops. He did it. Spider begins to fall and the people he just saved catch him last second. Also real quick, I've always loved how squishy he is here. <laughs> and in this scene that somehow doesn't feel corny or forced, Spidey is carried through the crowd and put down to rest. Some guy says, He's just a kid. And older than my son. Which I've always loved, because it reminds you that Peter really is just some guy with a massive heart saving all these innocent people. And I know it's been joked to death, but if this was modern day, this shit would have been live streamed, TikToked, Instagrammed, fucking sketched on a canvas. I mean, Peter would be docked, I'm telling you. Anyways, Doc Ock shows up and we get this beautiful scene. You want to get to him, you got to go through me. Very well. 
This scene, this scene is the peak of the movie and maybe the trilogy or filmology. I cannot tell you how many times I've watched this on my phone late at night instead of sleeping or doing something productive. It's not just ingeniously constructed action sequences, but because they successfully made you care about these characters, the fight becomes more than just weightless punches. Sorry to go so long about this film, but it's just so well done and so well executed. It has all the gigantic and stylish set pieces you'd want from a high budget Spidey film, but then it's also got this irresistibly lovable heart and soul that is what makes you come back. Spider-Man could punch anyone and it'd be fun, but watching Peter Parker, a guy who was just like us, struggle with the massive responsibility in the formative years of his life, that's what makes me love this film. He can either pay rent or save people's lives. He can either pass his classes or help out the neighborhood. He can be with the woman he loves or he can keep people safe. Except that last one gets taken out of his control. Right at the very end, Mary Jane ditches her own wedding and runs to Peter. Continuing her growth from the first film where she learned to take control of her own life, she overrides Peter's choice and says, but can't you respect me enough to let me make my own decision? So here I am standing in your doorway. I've always been standing in your doorway. I've always loved how there's this orange glow behind her in the shot, and then this kiss just feels earned, and then it's short-lived. There's responsibility calling. Go get him, tiger. And then he jumps out the window for one final swing. But, 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 what's so perfect about this ending is that it doesn't end on a heroic swing through the city. Instead, it cuts back to Mary Jane. We hear a depressingly looming note as we close in on her. She has a serious and worried look as she thinks about the choice she just made. The perfect way to end the film. But the film isn't perfect. There are a few things in here that just don't work. Toby, I think he is a lot better than he is in the first film. But there are still some lines delivered that are a bit wonky. It's weird, because some lines that sound awful on paper, he delivers really well. Oh boy, yeah. You try saying oh boy yeah in any context and not feel like a massive idiot. New Snug Boy video, oh boy yeah! But then on some lines he does sound awkward and it's like, Why is this happening to me? What? There are some silly plot things, such as Doc Ock's inhibitor chip, or him throwing a car at Peter for no fucking reason. I mean it looks great and it's a great visual, but what? We also finally got to the era where they try to get away with a lot more CGI than they probably should have. There is a lot of it that is still practical effects, but there are just one too many CGI humans and they don't look, they don't look great. Ugh. Although, do you gotta give him props for the CGI doc at the end? You can tell it's CG, but it's pretty damn good. Especially for 2004. And then there are awkward moments sometimes, such as when Toby gets out of the barbed wire. Or James Franco just doing anything. I have nothing left except Spider-Man. He's still here and it's weird and he's easily the worst part of this film and I do not like it. <laughs> And the score of this film is really lackluster. Danny Elfman hated his time in this film and quit as soon as he could. And although he creates a lot of great individual themes, a lot of the score is recycled. Themes ripped from the first movie are used on various occasions. And some pieces created specifically for this film are reused, but not in a cool light motif transfiguration sort of way, just in a replaying the same MP3 file sort of way. What the hell? But problems aside, I love this film so much. I love its tone, I love its heart, I love its story, I love the jokes, I love all these brilliant performances by minor characters, such as. You're late. I'm not paying for those. Or... And don't try to sneak past me. I have ears like a cat. And eyes like a rodent. I mean, Mr. Dickovich is just comic relief, but he's so good. I love how much Peter has to struggle in this movie, and the film isn't shy to show these moments. There's this beautiful scene where Peter notices Aunt May's eviction notice, and then she gives him $20 and he tries to refuse it and we get... No, I, I can't take that from Yes, you can. You can take this money from me. For God's sake, it's not much. Now take it. And don't you dare leave it here. I still can't believe a down-to-earth, realistic money problem is in a big blockbuster superhero film. And moments like this are why the film works so well. People don't say this is the best one for no reason. It's equally as brilliant as a superhero film and as a drama about a human character. And it's got pizza time, so I mean, what else do you want? He stole that guy's pizza! Okay. 
Spider-Man 3. This is the Spider-Man film that's infamous for being the worst one. If you were on the internet at all between 2007 and, well I guess now, you know how bad this film is. It's got too many villains, emo Peter is stupid, and it doesn't live up to the predecessor's enormously high expectations. Except I really kinda like this film. What? I haven't seen this one in at least five years, and if I'm gonna be honest, me and my then girlfriend made out during half the movie, so I haven't really seen it in like seven years. I went in really nervous and with really low expectations. All I could think was, please be good, 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 please be good. And I kept watching, and I kept watching, and I started to think, when does it get bad? And yeah, of course, there is a part of the film where it does get bad, right about here. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Why do people hate this film? Well, the big thing here is that there are too many villains and there is too much going on. And that's the biggest problem of this film for sure. It starts off with Harry as the new gobby, but then he is immediately sidelined, or I guess clotheslined, <coughs> into this amnesia plot. Yeah, look, it's not the best thing they could have come up with, but it works, I guess. Then we get to focus on the real villain of this movie, Sandman. Thomas Hayden Church is just another example of this trilogy's brilliance in casting. You take one look at this guy and it tells you everything you need to know about him. He's big and rough and yet he looks so sad. You can't help but just want to give him a hug or something. And he is so sympathizable. We first see him running away from the cops and breaking into a house, but then it turns out it's his daughter's house. He didn't want this criminal life, he just wanted to get money to pay for her sickness. America problem, my right up, bloody James, bloody Julia After being kicked out by his wife, he says the most crucial line for his character. I'm not a bad person, I just had bad luck. I love that line. And there are so many quotes and moments in this film like that that are just stellar. And one of the best in not only this movie or this trilogy, but I think superhero films in general, is this beautifully animated sequence of the Sandman being born. After getting stuck in a particle accelerator test, Flint wakes up the next day in the form of grains of sand. It's been talked to death by now, but it is just crazy how tiny rocks can have such an emotional impact. There is something just gut-wrenchingly devastating about watching this broken man try and make form and fail, and then try to reach for the one thing that matters, a locket of his daughter which he can't even hold. There's this one shot of just eyebrows, and I know it's CGI and it's not real, but it rips my heart in two every single time. It's slow and has such a beautiful score and just further strengthens everything you need to know about Flint Marco. He's not a villain because he wants to take over New York or because he hates Spider-Man. He's just a guy trying to save his daughter. That's it. He eventually becomes human again and storms off. And then his sideline for Venom. We all know the story by now. Sam Raimi wanted to focus on the Sandman and Harry as the new goblin. But cheeky bastard Avi Arad got his grubby little fingers into his ear and said, But Sam, think of the fans. They love Venom. You should do Venom. Venom will sell so many toys, Sam. And rightfully, Sam said, But I don't know Venom. How can I make a film about a character I don't know about, I don't care about? And then Avi and Sony said, But think of the month. The kid, Sam, the kid! And Raimi was forced to add Venom in. Now, if you're a fan of Venom in the comics, this portrayal is not for you. But I actually don't know how to read. Haha, <laughs> fuck you, I don't give a shit! No, but jokes aside, I do actually kind of like it. Kind of. Hear me out. Sam Raimi obviously thought, well, if I'm gonna do Eddie Brock, I have to make it work in my head. So what's the smartest way to go about this? And so he makes Eddie this almost evil shadow of Peter. I think that's a great approach, and I actually really like Topher Grace's performance as Eddie. He's cocky, he's a bastard, he thinks he's top shit, and it just works. It beautifully clashes with Peter's innocence and kind-heartedness, which puts pressure on him to compete. I think everything Eddie in this film works. The stuff with Gwen, going for the staff job against Peter, framing Spider-Man, all of it just works for me. Until he becomes Venom. Once he's got the symbiote and he's doing Venom shit, I don't know, it, it just stops working. He becomes the most 2D, unsympathetic, unrealistic villain in the entire trilogy. The Green Goblin was cut cartoonishly evil, but it worked because on the other side of the gob was this very human and struggling Norman Osborn. Doc Ock works because he's a beautiful soul seduced by evil artificial intelligence. Sandman works because he is sympathetic and you could see yourself doing the same thing if you were unlucky enough to be in his shoes. Venom is bad just because. I like being bad. It makes me happy. Ugh. And speaking of the symbiote, it just comes from space. What the fuck? That is the most random part of this trilogy. But let's talk about the black suit, because it's used really well. Spider-Man 3 actually has four villains, the biggest one being Peter's ego. We remember Spider-Man 2. His life sucked. But now, things aren't looking too bad. In fact, they're looking too good. He's got the girl of his dreams, he's figured out how to balance Spider-Man and Peter Parker, and the city loves him. 
I don't care who you are, even if you're just some random nerd from Queens, that's gonna go to your head. And so the film follows Peter as his ego gets bigger and bigger and how it cracks the relationships around him. A lot of people think MJ and Peter's relationship is melodramatic, but I really like it. Well, he's flying, she's falling. MJ finally makes it to Broadway as a lead actress, but her voice doesn't carry past the first row and she's soon let go. So while her boyfriend is saying, they love me, she is being forgotten about. As Peter becomes more and more obsessed with himself, he begins to hear her less and less. She comes into his apartment with the reviews to the play and she's super upset. Peter then turns the conversation onto him and starts talking about when he's Spider-Man, this and that. And if you've ever been in a relationship with someone who does that, oh, it's the worst. I'm talking about you, Janice. I know you watch my videos. And then he just finishes the conversation because he's got to go be Spidey, even assuming she'll be a cheerleader for him. Anyways, one amazing action sequence later, and he saved Gwen Stacy. Uh, she's in this movie, by the way, it doesn't matter. And then she's awarding the key to the city to Spider-Man, and then he does this. I mean, come on, dude, the fuck? And so later that night on a date where he plans to propose to her, which he thinks is going to go silky smooth with no hiccups because of course it is, he's Spider-Man. When she gets mad and upset, he is just completely baffled. And then it only gets more complicated because Peter and Aunt May get called about Uncle Ben and how they had the wrong killer. The real killer is actually a guy called Flint Marco. That's the Sandman. A lot of people seem to be bothered by this, but I really like it. Nothing is ruined by the killer being changed to a different guy, and it sets up the fuel to the main conflict of this film the black suit. Finally back to what I started this paragraph about, okay fucking took my time, sorry. The point of the symbiote is that it amplifies the host's negative emotions. So right now Peter is angry and bitter that his uncle's killer is still out there scot-free. Plus he's full of ego and plus he's Spider-Man, he's like super strong and stuff. So it's only natural that the symbiote is attracted to him. It creepily engulfs him, and god I love the way it looks, and then we see the new suit. Where am I? This new feeling of ego and power are captured perfectly by Christopher Young's score. It sounds powerful and I still get a thrill from hearing it. Now what's great about the black suit is that it's used almost symbolically as a metaphor for addiction. Every time he wants to commit some bad doing, fuel the revenge in his heart, he takes out the black suit. There are a couple scenes of him putting the suit away or being lured by it and just having this inner conflict in his eyes. But why would he use it? Because it lets him go sicko mode. The fight scenes in the black suit are way more brutal. We have this great underground scene where he's brutally smashing Sandman into a train and bashing the shit out of him and then reduces him to mud. Then he finishes it by saying, Good riddance. He also does this to Brock's camera. See you, chump. What the hell? This isn't the Peter we know. And as time goes on, the symbiote wears off on him and begins to change him permanently. Which is brilliantly shown by the scene where he tells Aunt May that Spider-Man killed Uncle Ben's killer and he's shocked when she isn't happy about it. Her beauty and humanity, the one thing that has always led him the right way through these films, even that doesn't get to him. What's so genius about this entire film is it's about the human characters. It's not about Spidey being black and being stronger, although the suit does look so good, it's so fucking good, cause holy shit, it's so good. But it's just fuel to the fire of the problems that were already starting with Peter and MJ and Harry. Speaking of, he's remembered he's a bad guy again. That didn't take very long. He kidnaps MJ and forces her to break up with Peter. And there's this scene where Peter and MJ are on this bridge and she breaks up with him and everyone loves to meme it and go, Arr, why wouldn't you say, hey, Peter, Harry's over there and he remembers everything and he's forcing me to say this. If that's what you think, I don't think you were paying attention to the film. She's breaking up with him here, yes, partially because she's being forced to, but mostly because she wants to. Peter wasn't there for her. He didn't listen. He became selfish. He couldn't be the support Mary Jane needed. And what does this rejection do to him? It breaks him. This is where, led on by the symbiote, he begins to spiral and spiral downwards and lose himself more and more. Firstly, he goes and fights Harry, his best friend, directly. With no remorse, he does this. Oof. And then we get this film's montage. I kinda like it, he hear me out. This is the part of the movie people always say is the most cringe. And I think that's the point. The hair is stupid, the eyeliner is stupid, the dance is stupid, but it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be laughing at Peter who's reveling in his ego and new persona. I love the part where he's got his feet on Jameson's desk. I love the finger guns, I love. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. I think why this montage doesn't work as well as say the raindrops one from Spider-Man 2 is because it's not very consistent with its idea. Like we're supposed to think that Peter is a loser and it's a funny scene and this is supported by mostly everyone giving him disgusted looks as he walks down the street. But then some of the girls are really into it and it's just like this weird mixed messaging. Uh, are we supposed to laugh or think he is hot? Huh? 
I think that's why there was a lot of confusion over this part, and if it doesn't work for you, I totally get it. But I will not excuse people who don't like the jazz scene. This shit fucking slaps! I mean, how can you not love a scene that starts out with this nerdy fucking loser going, Find us some shade. <laughs> Like, that is so funny. Not on purpose, but very funny. Like, I get that this dance is silly or whatever, even if I secretly kind of liked it. But why the scene works is, again, because it's all about the characters. Peter is a dick. He only takes Gwen to rub it further into Eddie that he's above him. And more importantly, to show off in front of Mary Jane. In her place of work, he shows up with a new hot girl, does his whole performance just to make her jealous. Like, what a dick. Luckily, Gwen wakes up to it and leaves him. Something begins to click with Peter, but the gears aren't all turning yet. He tries to talk to Mary Jane, but it refused. He begins to tussle with the guys and push them off, and then... Peter, stop it! Holy shit. This moment always hits really hard. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. But it's such a serious moment juxtaposed after this ridiculously goofy scene, and that's why I think it works. You can see it in Peter's face. He's finally snapped and realized he's stuffed up. The damage is done. We get this beautiful shot of Spidey on the church top. And at Peter's lowest, guess who else is also at their lowest? Eddie Brock. This madman, after being humiliated professionally and personally, comes to church after being told to You want forgiveness? religion. And the madman asks God, I want you to kill Peter Parker. Well, his wish is granted because just at the same time, Peter is trying to get rid of the symbiote. I've always loved how the echoes of the bell are what causes it to come off of Peter and how it screams out of his body. It begins to drip down onto Eddie and then we cut back to Peter and that is not Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Apparently he didn't get fit for this film and look, not to be rude, but you can kind of tell. But also I love the idea that with no clothes, Peter had to just swing home in the nude. <laughs> Anyways, remember how I said there was too much in this film, where well, we had the new gob, Peter and MJ's relationship, Aunt May's in there, and then there's Harry's five second amnesia, then there's the Sandman, and then there's Eddie and Venom, and then there's other things too, and it's just like, ugh. The film mostly does a good job of holding everything in, but it just kind of falls over the end when the finale starts. In the last two films, the finale came out organically and with a great build up. In this one, Peter is literally just walking through the street and then walks over to a TV and is like, oh shit, the bad guys are doing shit. Okay, I gotta go, I guess. Alright, bye. It's only redeemed slightly by the fact that Raimi is the king at having scenes of heroes returning to power again. But look, yeah, it's not the best finale, especially having Mary Jane be kidnapped again. Are you kidding? Oh my god. Which, fun fact, Kiss and Dunst didn't record new screams for this film, so they had to recycle them from the first two. <laughs> Despite it all though, seeing Harry finally join Peter and fight in his most desperate moment is pretty fun. And the whole thing is filled, of course, with brilliant Raimi spectacle. But what's most brilliant, again, is that the whole thing is character based. God damn, take a shot every time I said that. It's not about Spidey punching Venom, it's about Peter trying to reach Eddie, trying to reconcile with Harry, trying to right his wrongs with MJ, and trying to forgive Flint Marco. This monologue where Flint confesses to Peter about why he killed Uncle Ben is just beautiful. It's slow and emotional. Thomas Hayden Church acts his heart out as we see him struggle with emptying his soul to the man whose life he indirectly ruined. I love how when he shoots Uncle Ben you can see him say no with his lips. And what I love even more is that the Sandman isn't ended by him dying or Spidey punching him out of existence. Instead, Peter says, I forgive you. And the music here is just brilliant, especially when it swells after the forgiveness and Sandman floats off into the wind. What a beautiful, real human moment. They better not make him a villain again and nowhere home, I swear to God, Sony! And what I love about the end of this film too, unlike most modern blockbusters, unlike most ends to a trilogy, heck, unlike the endings to the last two films, is there's no triumphant final moment. Instead, Peter comes into the club MJ is singing at. The two catch each other's gaze and then they begin to dance. They hold each other and slowly spin. Two people who have been through so much and grown so much and here they are batted on the other side. What a beautiful way to finish the movie. This is gonna piss people off, but I'm just gonna say it. I would rather have a hundred more Spider-Man 3s than another lackluster MCU film. These films had heart and emotion and the passion of the crew bleed through the screen into this lovable piece of work. A lot of people love these movies, and while of course nostalgia plays into it partly, I think the major reason is that they're just solidly made films. They aren't really about some guy in spandex punching bad guys and saving the day, but they're about people. It's engaging to watch Peter Parker having to learn how to take on responsibility 
and live life and try to be a better person. They weren't trying to set up a cinematic universe, they weren't trying to tease the next five planned spin-offs, they weren't trying to be thoughtless dribble you eat popcorn to. They were and are these thoughtful and dare I say beautiful films about growing up into an adult, into a man. A SPIDER-MAN. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get superhero films ever like this again. And that's a part of what makes them feel so special. They feel like a time capsule into an era that is probably never coming back. But sometimes I wish it would. There were plans for a fourth film, with Raimi especially being very personally unhappy with the turn out of this one. I tried to make it work, but um, didn't really believe in all the characters and director doesn't love something, it's wrong of them to make it. And although I love it, there's something about the ending that doesn't feel resolute to me. It feels like the book isn't entirely closed. Whether they'll give us closure in No Way Home or not, I'm not ready for these films to be over. But Sony was, and only five years later they said, REBOOT! <laughs>